you're all very, very welcome to this Carrot Fly webinar, which has been organized by the Chagask uh, Horticultural Development Department. Uh, my name is Andy Welton, and I'm your MC for the for the next hour or so, but um, my co-host is, is Owen Sweetman. Owen is, is um, recently joined Chagask. He replaced Stephen Alexander, uh, who I know most of you would have known over many, many years. Stephen retired uh, late last year, uh, and Owen has taken over, and he's now our vegetable specialist based uh, in Ashtown in Dublin, covering the, 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 the eastern region. Uh, we'd like your participation in a small uh, online poll. And I'm going to ask Owen if, he, if he'd like to just introduce that and carry out that before we'll have, um, we'll have our presentations. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, Andy. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to launch the poll here. It's just three short questions. So the poll should be on your screen there now. And the first question is, what is your preferred insecticide program for carrot fly control? You should be able to uh, take one of the three options here. The first option is the sequential use of pyrethroids, such as karate and Jesus. The second option is the sequential use of karate with corrigin. And the third option is Benevia. The second question is, when do you stop spraying for carrot fly? And the options are early September, mid-September, late September, early October or mid-October. The third question is, would you consider using fly trapping and or weather data prediction models to provide more targeted and improved control programs? And you've yes, no, or undecided. So we'll just give you a minute now or so just to, to put, your, put your, your answers in there, whatever you think. So question one, the, possibly a bit of a surprise there, I, I'd say, Andy, that uh, sequential use of karate with corrigin is, is the most popular, slightly ahead of uh, the karate desis. Uh, option and 10% uh, um, of participants said they use Benevia. Um, question two, when do you stop spraying for carrot fly? Uh, the, the seems to be mid-September, late, late September, early October, but late September is the most popular. Um, and question three, when or would you consider using uh, fly trapping and or weather data prediction models to provide more targeted and improved control programs and Overwhelmingly, everybody said, uh, or nearly everybody, 82% of attendees uh, said they would consider it, and only 2% said no. Okay, so I'll stop sharing results and hand you back to Andy uh, okay. to continue on. Great stuff. Uh, thanks, everybody, for you know engaging there. That's, that's fantastic. That's very, very useful, I think, for both our... Um, presenters, it, it might just uh, put things in context a little bit as to the way people are thinking this side of the Irish Sea. So look, uh, without any further ado, can I introduce our first presenter, Professor Rosemary Collier. Rosemary, um, ladies and gentlemen, trained as an entomologist and has worked on pest insects of horticultural crops for years. She's given a lifetime as, as um, research in, in, on, on horticultural pests uh, with her main interest now in the development of application of integrated pest management strategies for horticultural crops, particularly field vegetables. She's a member of the Royal Horticultural Society Science Committee. She's chair of the UK Insecticide Resistant Resistance Action Group, and she's coordinator of the IPM um, Working Group for the European Vegetable Research Institute's Network. So there's a fairly good CV. Rosemary, um, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Um, um, we're, 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 we're delighted to have you and we look forward to your presentations. Um, so I'm going to talk, as Andy said, uh, about some of the research that we've done on carrot fly over the years. Um, and much of it is based on things that we've done at, at Wellsbourne in Warwickshire in the UK, um, where I'm based. Trying to do the next slide. Ah, right. So, um, in case we've all forgotten what we're we're talking about, um, then I thought I'd just give you a few images of of carrot fly. 
Um, so an adult fly, um, a large larva emerging, emerging from a carrot root, um, some carrot flies on sticky trap, um, and then um, on the left hand side, um, some carrots heavily damaged by carrot fly, and they were attacked when they were very young, and as a result, carrot fly killed uh, quite a number of the carrots. And then on the right um, is the damage that you would more typically see as a result of second generation carrot fly um, when the roots are fairly substantial and they, they burrow into the roots and make the mines. So here is a, a typical example of um, our carrot fly um, trap crap captures at, at Wellsbourne. This is 2019. Um, we have very large numbers of carrot fly at Wellsbourne because we um, grow carrots without insecticides all year round um, to ensure that we do have a population for experimental work. So in some ways it's atypical um, because they're so abundant. Um, and here you can see the, the usual pattern of fly activity um, for the middle of England. So three, three generations, first generation, second generation, third generation. And you can see here uh, the black bars are the, the flies emerging from the overwintering carrots. And then we move our traps into the new crop um, for the year. So I thought I'd base my talk around the integrated pest management pyramid, which is, is quite a popular way of talking about um, IPM. And the idea behind the pyramid is that you start at the bottom of the pyramid when you're planning your pest management strategy. Um, and so you start with uh, thinking about various agronomic practices, such as crop rotation, resistant varieties. Um, and then you go on to uh, look at your decision support tools. So you might use uh, traps to monitor, forecasting system. And then if you have got a problem or you perceive there's going to be a problem, um, then you might use um, some form of, of physical or natural control and, and crop covers would be an example of that. Um, there might also be biological controls that you could use. And then only if you still perceive that you have a problem, would you actually use chemical control? And another way of describing it is in terms of the different layers, so prevention, detection, and then control. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the pyramid um, and talk about a couple of uh, agronomic approaches. And, and one that I think is by far the best way of managing carrot fly, if you can, is crop rotation and isolation. And so the basic idea is that you isolate your new crops from your old crops um, to reduce the, the, carrot, the chances of the carrot fly finding your new crops. And this is an overview of, a, of an experiment we did at Wellsbourne quite a few years ago. Um, here's the source of our carrot fly, so where we keep our carrot fly um, population. And in that year, we sowed 11 plots of carrots at different distances from the source of the carrot fly. And then we recorded the numbers of flies, eggs, pupae in the soil, and then the amount of root damage in all those plots. And we got this, uh, at the time, quite surprising relationship. Um, you just need to remember that both the axes on this graph are on a logarithmic scale. So 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. You've got the distance from the emergent site, the overwintering site, because it was first generation carrot fly along the bottom axis. And then you've got either the numbers of flies captured on sticky traps or the, the percentage of roots damaged when we, we sampled roots from the plot. And you see for both of them, um, there's quite a good straight line relationship, indicating quite clearly um, that the further away your new carrots are from, from your old carrots, um, the, the less your risk of getting carrot fly. And there's at least a suggestion here that you need to separate your old and new crops by at least uh, a kilometer. And just the illustration, the plot on the left, which you've seen already, this was close to the source of carrot fly, and the one on the right was about a kilometre away, and you can see uh, no obvious signs of damage. Another cultural approach, um, which is, is possible um, to use um, in, at some times of the year, 
is actually to sow your carrots late um, to avoid the first generation of carrot fly, to avoid them laying eggs. I realise that with continuity of supply, it's not possible to do this for, for all your crops, um, but definitely probably for some. And again, this is a, an experiment we did at Wellsbourne um, where we sowed uh, small plots again at two week intervals from the middle of March to the middle of June. And then we allowed the natural population of carrot fly to lay their eggs on the plots. And then we covered the plots just before the beginning of the second generation with fine mesh netting, put some traps in there, and then we counted the numbers of flies that came out. So the second generation flies that came out. And you can see that for all the sowing dates, um, if you like, before the start of the first generation, um, then large numbers of flies emerged. Um, so we were perpetuating um, the population. Um, but for the plots that were sown um, from about the middle of May um, onwards, then the, the numbers of carrot fly in those plots were very low. Um, and that's just basically because um, when those um, carrot flies um, came out, um, there wasn't anything uh, much for them to, to lay eggs on or nothing at all in the, in the June um, option. So again, another approach that you can use. Um, so now I'm going to move up uh, a layer in the pyramid and just talk a bit about, about uh, detection, about um, decision support. And obviously you can use uh, sticky traps to monitor carrot fly and I've already showed you that we use these quite, quite often um, and we use them mainly uh, just to see what's going on and to also check out that our carrot fly forecast is okay. Um, and this graph again shows you the same data I showed you at the beginning, uh, but this time I've put on top of it the, the carrot fly forecast. So this is our, our forecasting model. Um, it uses soil and air temperatures from the 1st of February, and you can use it to predict um, carrot fly emergence and carrot fly egg laying. Um, and at the moment uh, in the UK, um, the output from the model um, is posted in the AHDB pest bulletin um, on the Syngenta website. And um, I run the model for about 10 different sites from Scotland in the north to Cornwall in the in the south um, and I think uh, Colin will talk some more about about timing um, but from from my sort of experience the the greatest value from that that forecast has been in timing um, the the start of treatments um, and particularly the pyrethroids uh, when we were completely reliant on those um, so timing the start of the application because we know we've known for a long time that the pyrethroids um, that are applied as foliar sprays, they only kill adult flies, they don't kill the, the larvae in the soil or the eggs. So you need to get your first spray on um, before they've started to lay significant numbers of eggs. So obviously our climate's changing um, and I've been thinking quite a lot about what will happen to carrot fly in a warmer climate. And one way to, to, I guess, sort of estimate what might happen is to look at carrot fly activity in a warmer place. Um, and this is a graph based on some information from a colleague, Francois Villeneuve, um, from Southwest France. Um, and as you can see, there are two peaks and a gap in the middle. And what um, they believe is happening is because it's, it's warmer there and very warm in the summer, um, that the carrot fly actually uh, become dormant for a period while it's warm in the pupal stage, and that's called estivation. Um, so they just stay dormant in the middle of the summer, and then when it cools down, uh, they, they emerge. So although this is sort of at the same time as our third generation would be, it's actually um, the second generation. And it looks as if uh, something like that might be starting to happen in the in the UK and we've noticed in some years at Wellsbourne um, that the second generation seems to sort of disappear a bit um, and then we get a, a sort of larger peak at the time of the third generation um, and that peak may be um, some third generation flies and also some um, east evading second generation flies and so I think my question is 
will um, late the second generation, third generation egg laying become more important in the future? Um, we did a bit of work 20 years ago to find out when we thought people should stop spraying. And at that time, the last new larvae of the year were found at the end of September, uh, which seems to tie in with your, the dates that you're stopping spraying. Um, but we have to keep our eye on that in case it changes. So back to my IPM pyramid again. Um, and now I'm going to go to the top of the pyramid and talk about insecticides. And obviously, I guess we've all uh, been very reliant on pyrethroids um, probably for more than um, 20 years. And that, that has been of some concern in, in, and people have thought, you know, maybe uh, resistance to pyrethroids might, might develop uh, during that length of time. So we've done a lot of work on insecticidal control of carrot fly. And when we started doing that work, it was um, on Hallmark, well, on Hallmark, which you call Karate, Lambda Cyhalothrin. Um, and more recently, we've been working on, on new products, and I'm going to talk about them um, a bit later on. Um, but in all our trials, we've always had a control treatment um, with no insecticide to see how the damage would be if we applied no treatments at all. And then we've also had what we call a positive control treatment, um, which is a very intensive, or what we think is very intensive program of pyrethroid um, sprays. And that, that's just to, to, if you like, see what the, the best scenario might be um, and comparison with, with new uh, treatments. So this is an example of our um, standard program. So we would apply the first treatment when our carrot fly forecast says that 10% that of flies are emerging, so the, the start of emergence. And then we would apply the pyrethroids at two weekly intervals, and we would actually go on longer than I think we actually need to, but, but say this is, this is for our positive control. And I just wanted to show you this graph. So this is, this is the, um, the data from the, from the untreated control and the positive control from 16 years of trials. Um, and you can see that all the points lie along a curve. So this is showing you the relationship between if you have that much damage um, on an untreated plot, what hallmark, um, a hallmark program is likely to do. And uh, it's not unexpected that it's a curve, but the interesting thing is that all the points do broadly lie on the curve and there's no evidence yet of resistance developing, at least at Wellsbourne. So now I'm going to talk about some of the um, more novel treatments, and I'm going to start with, with Corrigin, Chlorantraniliprol. Um, and here, um, what we have done is, and you're looking this time at percent undamaged roots. Um, so the higher the bars are, the better it is. And we compared um, three timings of, of Corrigin applications with Hallmark program and the untreated control. And naught here means that the treatment was applied when 10% of the second generation was forecast to emerge. So we've got here Corrigin applied at 10% emergence. Corrigin applied one week before 10% emergence was predicted, and then three weeks after 10% emergence, and then naught and two. And from this, you can see that um, the most effective treatment, um, whether that's a statistically significant difference or not between that and the hallmark, I don't know, was from Corrigin applied at naught and two weeks after 10% emergence. We actually done more work on, on Benevia, Cyantronilipol, and that has been uh, a lot of work um, for uh, DuPont, who, who originally uh, developed this, this product, and then it was recently passed to FMC. Uh, again, this is the results from a similar sort of trial, but with more treatments. So here we've got um, Benevia applied Norton 2, Norton 4, Norton 6, and that's two treatments of Benevia. And then we've got three 
um, pro well, they're not programmed, three single treatments of Benevia at 10% at, um, emergence, a week before 10%, two weeks before 10%, and then the hallmark program and the untreated. And again, you can see that the Benevia um, naught and two weeks is the, the most effective treatment, but actually all of the treatments and including these single sprays and single sprays applied in advance of the carrot fly uh, second generation are also pretty effective as as well um, and that is the very interesting thing about Benevia. Um, and here's another a trial again for DuPont um, where we were asking the question um, what happens if you apply Benevia quite a long way in advance of the start of the second generation of carrot fly and you might want to do that if you were also going to try and get some some benefit in terms of, of control of aphids on the crop um, and again these were just single sprays and again compared with the untreated you can see um, a good level of carrot fly control um, with the, the the zero weeks being the most effective but again there probably aren't there isn't a significant difference to say for example between those two um, so again showing showing sort of great persistence of activity. Um, so we try to understand um, a bit how um, how that how uh, Cyanotrilinipol, how Benevri is working. Um, so one of my colleagues, Andy Jukes, he did a, a small trial um, where he, he covered carrots with fleece to keep out the natural carrot fly and then he inoculated them with carrot fly eggs either before or after spraying. And then some of the carrots were, were sprayed by targeting the foliage and, and covering the soil around them so that the, the spray only went on the foliage. And some of them uh, were aimed at the, the soil. And what um, he found was that there was, there was control. Uh, this is the number of carrot fly mines, the number of holes per plot. Um, and there, there was control from either uh, approach um, but the, the control levels were similar for both application methods. So we still don't know sort of for sure how much activity there is against larvae, although in the next trial here, um, I'll show you, um, there is definitely activity against the flies as, as there is with um, karate. Um, and in this trial, um, basically, um, carrot plants, so this was in the laboratory, carrot plants were, were sprayed um, and then they were put into cages containing adult carrot flies at different times after spraying. So the carrot flies were exposed to residues of different ages in different cages. Um, and that showed that, that Benevia was very effective at killing the adult flies for at least eight days. Um, and there was some control for, for more than four weeks. So although we don't have any data on how this actually affects egg laying, um, it does support the results from the field trials, which indicate this prolonged control with a single application. And in terms of insecticides, I just wanted to say a bit at the end about um, aphid control. Um, in the, in the UK at the moment, I think aphids are actually of more concern than carrot fly, and that's due to uh, virus transmission, and that's related to, to the loss of the, um, the neonicotinoid seed treatment, um, which was quite effective in, in controlling aphids on carrot. Um, and again, this was work with DuPont, and they, they wanted to kind of see whether or how Benevia might be deployed um, against both aphids and carrot fly, maybe. Um, so this was a trial aimed at the willow carrot aphid and sprays were applied on two occasions uh, when aphids were on the plants. And this is just to point out that both Benevia and Mavento um, killed the aphids. Um, Hallmark did nothing, and that's because our willow carrot aphids are resistant to um, pyrethroids. And then what uh, happened in this trial was that it was then left um, in the ground um, and then um, carrot fly damage was assessed on the 14th of November just to see 
if there was any effect from those fairly early sprays um, of Bonevia. And as you can see here, there was. So this is the percentage undamaged roots. And you can see that Bonevia, although it probably wasn't a high le enough level of control uh, for, for the market, um, it, it did actually um, reduce carrot fly damage. And then there is quite complicated trial here, um, again, which was about looking um, at, at the potential for, well, at when um, one might deploy Benevia. Um, and so there were a number of treatments, so untreated, that's Cruiser, the C treatment. Um, then we got sprays targeted against aphids, and those were applied on the 25th of May or the, the standard one, A0, was applied on the 25th of May, and then we had sprays that were applied two weeks before that, or one week before that, and then two weeks after that, just to look at the different effects of timing. Um, and then there were a couple of treatments that then um, received subsequent applications for carrot fly as well, as did the cruiser treatment. So you can see in terms of aphid control, um, this is the number of, of aphids, um, on the plants that um, basically A, A plus two or A, O, so, so getting the timing spot on um, was um, better than applying the sprays too early, so, so not much persistence indicated in terms of aphid control. And then if you look at the carrot fly down here, um, then uh, this treatment had the Bonevia spray for aphids and then an additional Bonevia spray for carrot fly on the 31st of July and that uh, provided the best level of control uh, but again um, this, this treatment the cruiser one had additional hallmark sprays as did the Biscaya uh, but these again these Bonevia only treatments targeted against aphids um, still uh, provided a degree of carrot fly control. So back to my pyramid again, um, and I'm just going to say a couple more things about, about it. Um, what I haven't talked about are the, the physical uh, control, and of course that could be netting or vertical fences, and I say I think Colin's going to talk about those. In terms of biological control, then there has been some research, um, but nothing's been found that's either very effective or economically um, viable yet. So when you're talking about putting different treatments together um, for carrot fly control uh, to maybe reduce the reliance on insecticides, um, then uh, one way of thinking about it is to look at, at what sort of impact you might get from these different approaches. And so these are some estimates um, compared with a high-risk site, um, which um, might get, say, 15% damage uh, if, if no control methods were applied. And these are what people in various projects have estimated to be the impact of different um, approaches. So, for example, the type of resistant variety that you might be able to um, use at the moment might reduce damage by up to 50% compared with the susceptible variety. And obviously, if you used a crop cover and you used it properly, um, then you'd get no damage at all. And, and just to show you, this is pictorially, um, how these different treatments might, might lie. Um, and in there, I've also put in insecticide that might be 70% efficient and one that might be 90% efficient. Again, you've got your high risk site with a est estimated 15% damage. Um, and you can see a whole, a whole range of different levels of, of control by doing different things. And then what you can go on to is look at different combinations of those approaches um, to see how much um, you can reduce damage um, by combining certain approaches. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the detail here, um, but it is a good approach to start thinking about how you might reduce your um, the size of your infestation and reduce your reliance on insecticides. So I'm going to stop there. Um, so thank you all for listening and thank you to um, the organisations that have allowed me to use the data and funded the work. Um, the pyramid 
came from a, an EU project I'm involved in called Smart Protect. Um, and then thank you most of all to um, those who do the work, the field work, so Andy and Marion and our horticultural services team at Wellsbourne. So thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Rosemary. Um, <clears throat> Fantastic overview, uh, an awful lot of information. Um, I was just thinking there, you know, we'll have to, to sit down and study a lot of the graphs in a lot more detail to, to really get what's, um, what, what, what a, a lot of it is saying to us. Uh, and just to say on that point that look, the presentations, ladies and gentlemen, will be, will be put up on our website in the next few days. So you'll have time to, to maybe take take the, the the slides and the information and, and then read it through and digest it in your own time because there is an awful lot of information on there. Um, a lot of it very basic. I guess we're going back to basic agronomy when it comes to the, you know, meeting some of our obligations under the whole business of IPM and the Sustainable Use Directive, which we have to be very, very mindful and conscious of uh, now and going forward. And you've, you've touched on an awful lot of that, Rosemary. And what's encouraging, I think, is the work you've done on Benivia. It's great to know that there is, there's going to be a choice there going forward. You know, we, we do know that the pyrethroid programs are coming under pressure. That sort of chemistry is, 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 is coming under pressure going forward. So look, it's good to know that there's, there's, there's um, encouraging uh, results from the trials and that we have, we're going to have some options, albeit they may be expensive. Uh, there is one or two questions, Rosemary. I'm going to kick off and maybe ask you the, the first one that's come in. Can relying on DSS, Decision Support System, cause you to be too late anyway, due to being up to a week late waiting on a threshold? Um, well, that's the, I guess that's the difference between um, using a forecast and using traps to, to monitor. Um, so obviously, uh, ha, ha, with traps, how, how soon you get the information to a certain extent depends how often you visit your traps. Um, the idea being behind the forecast is that you get advance warning and as you get closer to the event, you get, I guess, more, more accurate 